People may say, screw this guy, I read on a forum, it's the cable, it's the cable! My confirmation bias says it's the cable because the cable is a $5 part and I want a $10 repair! My confirmation bias is more important than science! Hey everybody, how's it going? I have a kitten in my lap. Blackberry, you can stay here as long as you don't bite the microphone. But you cannot bite the microphone. I don't want to buy a new one. I got this thing for half off because I got it used with a little dent in it. And if I have to buy this microphone again, it's $800. So we're going to just, you're going to stop doing that so that we can do the video. So today I wanted to do a video that's really a follow-up on a video that I did about a week and a half ago. The video was how PR failings led people to assume the worst. Robin Hood screw up encouraged a populist revolt. And in that video, I went over how horrible, in my opinion, the entire response that the Robin Hood CEO gave when he got on CNBC was and why. And I just wanted to showcase a Bloomberg article that I think really hits the nail on the head here. And I also wanted to, again, tie in the same business lesson I tied in that video because the mistake that he made really applies to every business, including mine. This is a lesson that can be really easy to forget because it's easy to say this type of stuff when you're on the sidelines, but when you're in the hot seat, it can be really difficult to remember that honesty in these cases really does go a long way. And I hope that uh, people realize this. So here it says GameStop taught the Robin Hood CEO a lesson in PR. It took him way too long to explain why he didn't put his customers first. Sending ill-prepared or untested chief executives into the media wilderness can be disastrous and sometimes comical. A case in point is Vlad Tenev, the CEO and co-founder of Robinhood Financial LLC, the little company that has a trading app beloved by the small fry investors who took down the hedge funds giants in the GameStop saga. Tenev appears to be a well-meaning young guy, and he's checked off a number of boxes on his way to the spotlight. In 2016, Forbes put him on the 30 under 30 list, and last year Fortune added him to its 40 under 40 version. Robinhood's success made him wealthy, and he's been invited to share his wisdom to high school and college audiences. But amid the GameStop frenzy, he embarked on a series of opaque and sometimes unintentionally hilarious interviews that failed to dampen the outrage at his decision to block Robinhood's customers from buying GameStop shares. Here's Tenev with Bloomberg Television's Emily Chang last week after she asked him to respond to the drama. There's a lot of misinformation out there, Tenev said. There's people saying that we were forced to do this by market makers we route to or any other market participants. And I just want to come out and say this categorically false. This was a technical, an operational decision that we made because Robinhood as a brokerage has financial requirements, including clearinghouse deposits that we have to make to various clearinghouses. So to protect the firm and to protect our customers, we temporarily disabled buying. That's quite a mouthful, and some of it hard to swallow. As GameStop shares soared, in part because Robinhood's customers were buying them, hedge funds shorting the stock got crushed. And then BAM! Ten have closed the spigot. Who was he protecting? He said his customers. Robin has always stood and will continue to stand with the individual investor. Their ability to have access to buying and selling stocks, he told Chang. In the interview, Ten have wandered all over the map while displaying the warmth and transparency of a chatbot. He compared the demand for Robin Hood services to the demand for Clorox and Lysol during the COVID-19 pandemic, suggesting that his platform was similarly overwhelmed by an unforeseen crisis. Asked how it felt to have a prominent Democratic representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and a prominent Republican, Senator Ted Cruz, jointly criticize him, he offered this nugget, irony-free. We are glad both sides of the aisle are coming together here. Tenev might have simply explained that Robin Hood's issue with clearinghouse deposits was what persuaded him to shut down his investors. Instead, he meandered and obfuscated, leaving his company mirrored in conspiracy theories about what actually occurred. Clearinghouses help brokerages such as Robinhood settle trades. But if a clearinghouse is worried that a brokerage doesn't have the financial wherewithal to backstop billions of dollars of orders, torrents of GameStop buys, for example, it might ask the brokerage to fork over piles of extra money to protect the clearinghouse from crippling losses. If a brokerage can't post the money, it might not be able to stay in business. That's where Tenev found himself, squeezed by the market's machinery. Tenev was worried about Robinhood's survival. I suspect that in the moment, that mattered to him more than the interest of traders in the platform. All of this became clearer when Tenev sat for another interview with, of all people, Elon Musk. The Tesla guru, self-style philosopher, COVID-19 misinformer, and unpredictable slayer of short sellers, of course they have to add that jab in there because it's fucking Bloomberg, but I digress, spoke with Tenev on Clubhouse, a new social media platform. Vlad the stock impaler, Musk said, introducing Tenev with a Dracula joke. Hey guys, thanks for inviting me up. It's good to hang out with all of you, Tenev responded, as if he were another day at the beach. One of the great things is all of the people coming out of the woodwork to offer support for the company offer, you know, advice. Tenev had just spent days getting slammed for blocking game stock buys, and that felt like people coming out in support of the company. Musk wasn't having it. Spill the beans, man. What happened last week? Why can't people buy GameStop shares, he said. The people demand an answer. 
and for the first time, Tenev gave one that was complete. He told Mus he was awakened in the wee hours last night with a call from Robin Hood's clearinghouse, put up an extra $3 billion to back up all the purchases of GameStop shares. He somehow managed to negotiate that down to $1.4 billion and then began shoveling over the money. As an added measure of protection for himself and his firm, Tenev then told his customers that they couldn't buy GameStop. An added measure of protection for himself and his firm, not his customers. Tenev then told his customers that they couldn't buy GameStop. The guy who'd kept saying Robin Hood stands for democratizing access to stocks wanted to stop trading in the most undemocratic of ways. It sounds like this organization called you up and basically had a gun to your head, Musk offered. Either hand over this money or else. Yeah, I think that's fair. We only have, we have to comply with these requirements, Tenev said. 24 hours later, our team's raised over a billion dollars in capital. If it was that easy to raise money, maybe Tenev shouldn't have cut off his customers. But I'm not running his business. He also told Musk that Citadel LLC, a company that operates a big hedge fund, as well as a market-making arm, Citadel Securities, that handles a lot of Robin Hood trades, hadn't forced him to halt GameStop buys. Here's the thing about Citadel Securities, though. Its relationship with Robinhood is lucrative. It gets to see what trading patterns emerge among Robinhood's customers, which is one of the reasons Robinhood can offer commission-free trades to little folks, but that's another story. The moral of the story is that clarity and transparency can be curative. It shouldn't have taken so long for Tenev to explain why he clipped his investors' wings this last week. Maybe next time, when inevitably there will be another round of bonkers excitement over an obscure stock, Tenev and Robinhood will help better help their investors and everyone else clearly understand what's going on. Now, now, when they had stopped allowing people to purchase GameStop, he had went on CNBC and he had said that there was no liquidity problem. Now, the only reason outside of some sort of malevolent intent or anything like that that I could imagine or that most people could imagine for stopping trading outside of a liquidity problem would be that you have an improper relationship with someone who has an interest in seeing GameStop fall. GameStop fall. Now, if you had a liquidity problem, if you came out and said, listen, we need to deposit this amount of money with our clearinghouse I don't got that money. Maybe I'll have it by tomorrow. Maybe I'll have it in a day or so, but I don't have it right now, which is why we had to stop trading. People would have hated him. They absolutely would have hated him, and a bunch of people wouldn't have believed him, but I'm confident there would have been a lot less people out there that would have assumed malice intent. When you say something like that, that's just so fundamentally mealy-mouthed and weasel-worded, people are not necessarily going to believe you. And if they're, if they're not, if, if I can't believe the reason that you gave me, and there is a potentially worse reason out there that is really just kind of sitting out there in the ether and not being addressed, lots of people are going to assume that. Admittedly, I was one of those people. I did make a video afterwards explaining why they did not allow uh, buying and selling, and I also did a very long video walking everyone through the what I believe was actually the case, and I, I linked in all my videos this to this one so that people would kind of have an idea of where my thought process was, why my thought process got there, and what was actually going on afterwards with the, uh, with, with the, with the interview with the guy from, from Weeble. So Weeble pr guy pretty much came out and said, you know, here's why we were not able to allow buys. Our clearing houses would have required a certain amount. Clearing houses are simply not that well capitalized. The DTC raised deposit requirements. And you also must understand that it's not possible for the average individual consumer to just go out there and do his own research and figure out how much collateral they would have required. Like me, I can't just go to DTCC's website and see, oh, okay, so they raised the collateral requirements on GameStop or BlackBerry this much that day. That's information that you, the broker who deals with this whole system would have had access to that we don't. And you could have told us that information so that we could come to a conclusion ourselves rather than just, you know, we're trying to help you. Now, one of the things I explained in that video that I did is... I've had these cases with, with my own customers, and here's the thing you have to believe, and here's one of the, the important parts of running a business. You have to believe that when you, that even if you're in a shitty situation, when you tell the truth, whatever happens is going to be the best possible thing that happens. So one example that I give is, let's say people see that I solder stuff, and they see that I'm good at replacing BGA chips, and they have a A1398 MacBook with, their, with uh, 8 or 16 gigs of RAM, and they want, I don't know, 16 or 32. They want an upgrade. And I say, well, no. I could say, no, that's not a service that we offer because we care about the blah, blah, blah of our customer. But that's kind of a, that, that, that is that kind of mealy mouth answer that doesn't actually tell you anything. And that may cause someone to assume that I, maybe I suck, maybe I'm not good at my job, maybe my videos lie about how good I am. 
or maybe I, I just don't want to do it because I don't like them, which ironic, that that's actually the conclusion that people come to most often when I hire a new customer service person who doesn't understand this part aspect of our company who says something like that. They usually just assume that we personally hate them. You'd be surprised, but it happens. What, what I do is I say, okay, I'd like to be able to do this upgrade for you. The problem is I can't actually buy these chips new. I can only buy them used, and they, oftentimes they don't even have solder balls on them. After I reball these 32 chips that I may not know if they work, I need to solder them on the board. And once I do, if it beeps, if it doesn't work, I have no way of telling which one of the 32 chips it is that's bad. So while this is technically something that is doable, it's not something that I can figure out how to do economically. We only charge if we fix the board. We would have to replace your board if we wind up causing your working board with less RAM to now beep. I have no way to tell which chip it is that is causing the beeping if the machine refuses to boot after it's done. Here's how much we pay our staff. Here's how much we pay in rent. I have no way to make this work in an economically viable way. Maybe another business does. Here's a list of businesses that may be able to offer this, but here's why we don't. Now, when I say that, I have a more canned response way of saying it that's a little bit more eloquent. There are probably people that still say, okay, you suck. But 99% of the time when I say that, people are dis they're disappointed, but they're not as disappointed as they would have been if I just said, no. Because I could technically say, no, there's, not, there's no money in that. I'm not doing it for you. Then they assume, well, he, this guy's just a selfish piece of shit. I don't like him. When I actually explain the, the reason, the real reason behind why I'm in the situation I'm in, I'm technically saying the exact same thing. I'm saying no. I'm saying there's, no, there's not enough money for me to make it worthwhile. But when I explain the actual reality behind the situation, most people, 99% of the time, understand. There are some people that are jackasses every now and then that I, I got some review on Yelp recently and someone brought in an A1534. We politely explained the reason that we uh, we don't work on this device and Kevin gave all the reasons and he still went on there and was like, I'm a corporate manager. But most of the time, most of the time, people are understanding if you explain it. And let's say that someone is actually disappointed with you because you give an answer that's not ideal. Well, you have to remember that if you're honest and if you allow someone to, you know, enter your world and understand where you're coming from, whatever happens is going to be the best possible thing that happens. So even if the person goes, ah, oh, and leaves disappointed after their, ah, oh, the annoying passive aggressive sigh and leaves, that's not a great thing. You have to understand that you told the truth. If you didn't tell the truth, maybe you would have gotten the passive-aggressive sigh and a one-star review and that person telling everybody they know, don't use this guy. Another example where this comes up with me, uh, you know, let's say people, this happens all the time for the past 12 years. People say, I want you to replace the screen cable. Replace the screen cable. Can you replace the screen cable? And I'll say, absolutely, I can replace the screen cable. Under one condition. When you still don't have a picture on the screen, you, you don't, don't tell me you don't want to pay. It's like, what? What? What do you mean? I want to fix the screen cable because my image is distorted. And I'll say, well, on this machine, this machine uses embedded display port. Old computers where people replace the screen cable when they had a distorted screen used LVDS. LVDS is a protocol whereby if one of the individual lines is corrupted in some way, you will get a distorted picture, but you will still get a picture because it's about the difference between the different lines. Embedded display port is different. It's an all or nothing protocol. So if one of these lines is not working, you're not gonna get a distorted image, you're gonna get no image. You have a distorted picture on your screen, which means that it's not the display cable because if the display cable were bad, you would just get no image on your screen. Now, if you really do believe it's the cable, here, I'll give you one. You could install it in my store. I'll give you a table. I'll set you up someplace. You could try plugging it in, but it's, it's not going to work. You need a screen. Now, I understand that this news sucks. I understand it's not what you want to hear, but I'm not going to replace the display cable because I know that's not it. Here's why I know it's not it. Here's why I know it's a waste of time. People may say, screw this guy. I read on a forum. It's the cable. It's the cable. My confirmation bias says it's the cable because the cable is a $5 part and I want a $10 repair. My confirmation bias is more important than science. That's, that almost never happens. That happens like 0.001% of the time. Most of the time, people will be like, all right, that sucks. Thanks. Instead of, you're, you're, you're lying. You're making that up because you want to make more money. Because there are lots of times where people will assume if we don't give enough information, I'm saying I don't want to replace the cable because I want to charge you for replacing the screen while actually only replacing your cable and windexing off your screen so it looks like a new screen so that I get to make five or $600 in profit off of my $5 cable. I explain everything because I understand. As someone who has owned a repair shop for 12 years, 
that people are always assuming the worst because people don't trust repair shops. People don't trust the mechanic. They don't trust the shade tree mechanic. They don't trust the independent repair guy. They've been told for a long period of time the independent repair guy is out to get you and nickel and dime you. One of the things I wanted to do with this channel is kind of change that, get people to understand that we are humans too. So I try to let people into my world. And when you take a look at the different approach that the Weeble CEO took to the Robinhood CEO, what the Weeble CEO did is he really tried to drag you into his world. He said, here is where we're coming from. Here is how all of this works. Here is how DTC deposit requirements work. And I've heard people say that anybody can figure out how, you know, clearinghouse deposits and all that work, half and half true. How are you able to figure out what the deposit requirements are for particular securities if you are not a broker or a clearinghouse? The average layperson has no way of telling at a particular point in time, and please do correct me if I'm false here in the comments down below, of what the specific clearinghouse deposit requirements are for a specific security at a specific time, unless someone who is inside that system chooses to say something. The Weeble CEO chose to say something. He chose to be honest with his customers. And here's the thing. People didn't believe him. Some people didn't believe him. I remember listening to the interview when it came out. I stayed up like a vampire until two or three in the morning to listen to the Weeble CEO interview. Let's see if I, uh, I listened to that Weeble interview when it first came out and then, you know, had my questions for it around one or two in the morning, listen to the whole thing. And here's the thing. You'll see that there are comments here where people don't believe what he said. There were also people that said, okay, that seems kind of fishy, but I think I have an idea of what's going on now. Even if they didn't believe him fully or thought that there were points that they had doubts on, there wasn't that, that aggravation towards him that this person is evil and this company needs to be immediately ruined and bankrupted and destroyed for their horrible action that you saw directed at Robin Hood because he actually came out and attempted to speak the truth, to explain what was going on, to tell the truth, and assume that what happens is going to be the best possible outcome. And this is something that I think is really important for anybody that has a business. There are times where you may think that explaining the truth to your customer is going to suck. And there are a lot of times where, for me, to explain the truth to my customers really sucks. You know, let's say someone comes in and says, can you replace the screen on this? And I say, no. They go, why not? because I'm not able to buy a screen for it. Well, I thought you were a Mac repair shop. Why can't you say you're a Mac laptop repair specialist and you can't even buy a screen for a Mac? Well, yes, I can't because I used to be able to buy screens from these particular LG brokers and distributors and Apple has told the companies to stop selling to these distributors so that I'm not able to buy anymore. And unfortunately, I don't have the resources to compete with a $2 trillion company, so I can't buy the part that I need to fix your computer. I'm sorry. <sighs> Sucks. Horrible answer, but here's the thing. Telling the truth, whatever whatever outcome occurs is gonna be the best possible outcome. You may think that it's gonna be a bad outcome, but you have to understand deep down inside that whatever winds up occurring is gonna be a better outcome than what happens if you BS people. Hell, I have an entire video covering this situation with some of the newer MacBooks where with the newer MacBooks in this video, Apple wins, I go over how I'm not able to get a chip that I need to fix a specific MacBook. If I could get it, I could have fixed that MacBook. I wasn't able to get it, so I had to tell this customer, I'm sorry, I can't fix it. The customer is mad at me for it. So I tell them very honestly, listen, I'm not able to buy this chip because the manufacturer of the device that you purchased goes out of their way to ensure that it's not made available to me. Now, they may not believe it. That customer may be mad at me because I told the truth rather than make up some bullshit answer. However, as a result of me telling the truth about what goes on in this industry overall, we have Right to Repair as a movement. We have 1.5 million subscribers and a YouTube channel where I discuss Right to Repair. We have Right to Repair legislation being pushed in many states. And tens of thousands of my customers understand that this is an issue. I lost with that one individual customer. But overall, in aggregate, I won. That's what's going to happen when you actually tell the truth. You're going to lose sometimes. You're going to look stupid sometimes for a small subsection of people. But it's going to be a better overall outcome than if you make shit up. And you have to believe that it's worth looking stupid in that moment to tell the truth. You have to believe that overall, you will be better off and society will be better off by you telling the truth in that moment, even if telling the truth makes you look like a goddamn fool. If you say that you have a, you got a money problem, listen, we don't have a liquidity problem because we stop trading on, G, uh, or we stop allowing purchases of GME. And if we stop allowing purchases of GME and we get a line of credit, 
maybe then we won't have a money problem going into the future. But I'm afraid that if we allow trading at this point in time or purchasing, that will create a money problem into the future. And I, I, I want to avoid that. Listen, we're, we're not Chase. We're not Wells Fargo. We're not Bank of America. We are a new small trading firm that caters to noobs. We're not the best capitalized, man. We're not prepared for this. I'm sorry we weren't prepared for this, but that's the case. People would have hated him, but they wouldn't have hated him because he was malicious. They would have hated him because he was incompetent. And there are people that hate him because he's incompetent, not malicious, but I still, I would rather be hated for being incompetent than hated for being malicious. It's more forgivable and it washes off easier in the next few weeks. So this is one article, another article in Bloomberg that I think is a good one where they're talking about this. It says, Robin's collateral crunch explanation puzzles Wall Street. One person here says, once every decade or so, there are improbabilities that occur, said Weisberger, which now runs cryptocurrency venture coin routes. Self-clearing firms such as Robinhood need to know what potential demands they could face. If they studied it and came up with an answer and it was wrong, well, shame on the people who studied it, he said. If they didn't study it, well, then shame on them. The way I interpret this article is they're saying they should have known this was coming and they should have been able to prepare for it or warn their customers or gotten access to the credit or the liquidity necessary to be able to deal with this event. And if they did not see it coming, then they're not doing their fucking job. And I agree with that. But again, I would much rather be seen as impotent or incompetent than malicious. And people have said, well, you have to understand why someone would not want to get on CNBC if they have a financial services platform and say they have a liquidity problem. I'd rather have a liquidity problem than have a malicious intent problem that's that's what i think of all this and i know there's going to be a lot of people that say well lewis if they allowed why would they stop buying but not selling i i i know i'm going to get that i i get that almost constantly now i have and actually i actually did a full video explaining this entire thing down below selling is not going to require uh, collateral buying does which means that if you are a shittier firm like robin hood you are not going to be able to allow buys if you're not properly capitalized, whereas a properly capitalized firm would be able to allow buys and sells. People say, well, how can you sell if there's no buyers? There are buyers. The buyers are using brokers that don't suck. Again, there, there are brokers out there that are not Robinhood that are actually properly capitalized enough so that if deposit or collateral requirements go up, they don't have to just stop you from being able to buy. I'm going to include a link to that video here. Nobody will probably watch it. I, I'm used to this by now with people saying, why would they allow... Uh, uh, why would they allow sells but not buys? That comment keeps co showing up. Just It doesn't matter how many times I answer it at this point. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And I really do hope that for those of you who are starting your own business, that you do get a PR lesson from this. There is a really, really, really good PR lesson about honesty to be learned here. And I just find it surprising. I've listened to a lot of the interviews with Vlad. I remember going to a therapist and I remember my therapist at some point giving me the Asperger's test. Whether or not I have it, they thought, you know, there's, there's, let's give Lewis the test just to see. And it's just weird that someone who could be confused as someone as having Asperger's is able to understand this basic concept better than a billionaire CEO of a large financial services firm. The, how you go out there and just completely misunderstand how people are going to interpret the things that you say. I'm bad at understanding how people are going to interpret what I say. I'm very bad at this. I'm not a particularly good person socially. But even I can understand that you, you, you should try to be somewhat honest with people, not use these types of weasel words when this much attention is on you and when tensions are as high as they are. Let me know what you think. The comments down below. See you later. I'll leave links to everything down below. And uh, that, that's about it. And for those of you who are really kind of curious what the hell went on this past week entirely, I did a video that really tries to summarize the whole thing. It seems long, 35 minutes, but I try to sh uh, speed it up as much as I can, include as much relevant backstory and why everybody, including me, thought the things that we did. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'll see you in the next video. Bye now.